Welcome to the Principles of Performance podcast, where we discuss how to optimize your health, fitness, and performance. Drawing on decades of experience of working as coaches, consultants, and trainers to top performers, athletes, and teams from professional sports to top universities to the U.S. military, Eric Degatti and Mike Perry discuss topics and strategies of how to perform at your highest level and be your very best. Join us and our friends and colleagues who are leaders in the fitness and performance industry as we investigate and challenge the most popular training, nutrition, lifestyle, and recovery protocols. Here we are at episode number 34 of the Principles of Performance podcast. I'm your host, Eric Degatti, and today I'm flying solo. Uh, my co-host and good friend, Mike Perry, couldn't be with us uh, today because of a scheduling conflict. And part of that scheduling conflict was we've been chasing this next guest down for, for months trying to get him on. And when you when you hear the episode, you're going to hear why. And you're also going to hear, when you hear his bio, you're going to hear why it's taken months to get him on. Uh, this guy's uh, an old friend. We'll kind of connect the dots in a little bit, but Dr. Dominic Sportelli, you might have actually seen or heard of. Uh, he's a medical physician. Um, I'll give you a little bit of his quick background. He's got his bachelor's in biology, master's of science in biology, uh, and then went to NYIT uh, School of Osteopathic Medicine, started off in general family medicine, and then pivoted to focus on mental health and began his four-year residency at general psychiatry at Robert Wood Johnson, all here in New Jersey. Um, he's board certified by American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, and he's fellowship trained in child and adolescent psychiatry. He's now the associate program director for Prime Health, where he's overseeing uh, resident education for multiple schools uh, and dealing with with education on that front. And then you 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 as I said, you might have seen him before, is because he's been a noted expert media personality, appearing on as a regular guest on TV shows like The Doctors and Fox News and various news outlets. And as famous as he is, he got his start in his humble beginnings as one of the first trainers on my staff at One Human Performance a million years ago. And it is an honor to have a, 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 an old friend, Dr. Dominic Sportelli, with us today. Eric, the honor goes both ways. And, and I have to say it, you know, when I think back, and I mean everything I'm saying right now, I, gotta, I have to give you some kudos. You and your brother, Michael, probably were some of the most impactful people in my life. And I mean that sincerely. I was going for my master's degree, trying my hardest to get into med school. I was working at Eric's facility. I remember being in the back room studying for my MCATs. I remember Mike, your brother, helping me understand some biology stuff that I was studying at the time because you guys were always so brilliant to me, still to this day. Um, so yeah, man, kudos. What amazing memories. And honestly, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. So right back at you, buddy. Well, that's uh, that's very humbling. And and. Uh, uh, so with that, let's kind of talk a little bit about more of our, our interactions. And so um, I reached out, you know, a couple months ago, just checking in to see how, how life was going. And you told me about how you had some, you know, had some some issues you're dealing with. You know, Dom is a is if you haven't figured out a pedal to the metal guy, literally and figuratively, like he's big into motocross with his kids and said he's kind of banged up, had some back issues. And so came in, you asked for some help and we put you through an eval and um, gave you a program. And you said you went home, you tried it, felt great. And then you immediately stopped doing it two <laughs> weeks later. And so you're board certified in psychiatry and neurology. How does someone who's one of the most biggest thought leaders in the world in mental health fall into this trap? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the quick and easy answer, and then we'll get into the specifics. It's because you're making the assumption that the prefrontal cortex is more powerful than the primitive brain. That's the assumption that you're making. That's the assumption that I'm making and my behavioral patterns and my habits superseded all of the amazing stuff that you were showing me and what I should be doing, as opposed to what I was used to doing and what I thought made me feel better immediately. That's the quick and dirty of it all. And that's what we deal with. Listen, this conversation can go so far on so many branches, but that's the basics of it, Eric. You know, we are creatures of habit and there's a reason for that. There's a reason that we are creatures of habit and studying psychiatry and behavioral health, we're creatures of habit. 
because it's all about efficiency. Our body, as you know, biologically, physiologically, training, all the adaptation that you work with, with clients, and the psychology and the psychiatry that I work with patients is all about efficiency. Your brain and your body want to use the least amount of energy possible with the least amount of work. That's, and, and, your, and your brain and body are always saying, stay alive, stay alive, stay alive, stay alive. It's worried about that. So can I get through the day doing the least amount of work, least amount of energy and survive? And that's why we develop habits because they're efficient. So if we don't work at breaking those habits, we're going to be stuck in that pattern. And a board certified psychiatrist does not have an advantage. Now, that's the same reason why a cardiologist might go and have the biggest burger you'll ever see in your life. Uh, the same reason why an addiction medicine doctor who knows Everything about addiction can be addicted to opiates, right? We're not immune to the basic primitive workings of our brain. Yeah. And, you know, we're going to go down every one of those branches that you talked about. We've actually had this podcast probably about three, four yeah. times over the phone. And we said, come on, we got to hit record on this thing. Um, so, yeah, I think the first point is very valid. You know, people meet me as a trainer and they're like, oh, I can't eat, any, eat anything bad around you. Oh, you must never, all you want to do is work out and, you know, eat kale. And it's like, no, I'd love to sleep till 10 and have a, you know, a, a bagel sandwich and like be a sloth. But <laughs> at some point we have to be an adult, right? So um, there's, there's some responsibility with that. And then the irony is something that you just mentioned is in terms of efficiency is like, that's the very thing that I'm actually training you for is the irony of all that, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm training an athlete, the idea is to get the most work done with the least amount of efforts so that you can mm -hmm. be more efficient. A great mm -hmm. athlete makes it look easy. If you get more, the more fit you get, the more efficient you are at burning calories, the more efficient you are at utilizing energy, the more efficient you are, basically every movement you do throughout the day. So the irony is the very thing that you're running away from fitness for they're the very things that fitness can give you so like that's the really crazy thing about all this and that's where i want to go down all these rabbit holes and so let's start by saying like is the fatal flaw in how we approach health and fitness just in general is it that we try to give rational explanations to and plans to human beings that are just are not rational by nature that we're just primal beings i think partly yes i think i think that's a very big part of it you know and i i, I can't help but go back into, we need to understand what makes us who we are, right? I'm in my forties. I have 40 years of reinforcement, Eric, 40 years of tiny little inputs that make me who I am today, that, that make my personality the way it is, that make my habits the way they are, tiny little inputs. My analogy to that is, do you know what sea glass is? Sea glass is like it used to be a sharp piece of a Coke bottle, but it tumbled in the ocean for like 20 years. And now it's this beautiful, smooth little piece of glass, right? You know what I'm saying? Over erosion from tiny little inputs over years. Well, that's how humans are. We have so many little tiny inputs that shape us into who we are right now. Now you're getting someone who's showing up at your door and saying, listen, I have a problem. I need to change. What do I do? There's some sea glass being presented to you. Now, your job is to reshape that sea glass that has 30, 20, 30, 40 years of shaping. Well, listen, you can either get out a sledgehammer and try and reshape that sea glass, which you might break it, or you can just start reshaping it slowly with tiny little inputs the same way. So I think to partly answer your question is we might expect too much too soon from people. Um, we don't set them up for small attainable goals. And we'll talk about all the different theories, goal theory and reinforcement theory and the old behavioral psychology theories of Skinner, BF Skinner. But we need very small attainable goals. And when I mean attainable goals, I mean something even subconscious that that person experiences as a reinforcement to keep going, right? So um, we might be biting more off than we can chew. Now, look, I do think education is an enormous part of it because that gives the person insight, right? It gives the person insight. Um, but there are a lot of correlations here, Eric, and, and, and I, wanna, I wanna use some analogies. One of the things that I do at the hospital is detox people off of substances, okay? Specifically opiates, people get addicted to opiates. Now this is kind of a good analogy. It might sound far-fetched, but I think it's a good analogy because they know it's bad for them. They know it could kill them. They know that the next dose that they get in the street is going to kill them potentially with all the fentanyl out there. People are overdosing like crazy, but 
they still do it. Now, if I give them a speech about how bad it is for you and you can't do this, and I'm gonna give you the neurophysiology of why opiates are bad and why it affects your brain and why it stops your breathing. Do you think, do you really think that that is gonna be the impetus to make them stop? It's not, it's not. The goal with addiction therapy and treatment is what we call motivational interviewing. It's understanding where that person's mindset is right there and getting them, getting them to make that change from deep down inside and having the motivation to do that. And that's the only way you can change somebody like that. And I know that might be a far-fetched kind of analogy, but I do think it's relevant because if you think about it, guess what happens when we work out? We get a dopamine spike. We feel good. It is a little bit of a buzz. It's a little bit of a high. It's not heroin, but it is a physiologic response. But my point is you can intellectualize all day and tell them why it's good for them, why it's bad for them, how their brain works, why they're addicted, the physiology of why they feel sick when they stop. Not going to do anything. Um, it's a foundation to educate, but it, you really have to get them motivated for that internal change. And then that's how you have success. No, it's exaggerated, but it's a very, it's a very eloquent analogy. And so um, it kind of pivots to, there's a famous expression that I love to steal. And especially when I coach and I coach kids is, is, is to say that you kind of get what you tolerate. And it also applies to, to when I'm working with that 50 year old that comes in the door to say, okay, are you okay with who you are right now? Are you accepting? Is this what you want to be now or in 10 years? And so like how much of our success or failure is determined by the standards by which we hold ourselves to and what we'll accept? Unbelievably so. Now, mindset, all right? This is a very, very, very important term in training individuals and changing behavior, mindset. Now, again, I keep using myself as an, as, as a, as a, as an example, 40 years of mindset, right? Every day, sort of being efficient. I have my, my perspective on the world, what I'm capable of, what I'm not, my limitations, my goals, my boundaries. This is mindset. Now, a particular population that's very interesting to study when it comes to motivation and doing things that are challenging are the Navy SEALs, right? Um, there's a lot of data about these, this group of individuals because they're put through some of the most challenging training known to man. And the idea is to get them to quit. And the people that don't are the ones that move on to the next level. They're weeding out the individuals that can't tolerate change, that can't tolerate discomfort. Now get this, there was a recent study done where they looked at 174 Navy SEALs and all that they looked at, Eric, was their mindset. How did they perceive discomfort and stress. There were groups that said discomfort and stress is not good. It doesn't have good outcomes. And there were some that had a mindset of stress and discomfort has a positive outcome. That's the only difference. Guess who did better, right? It's, it's not rocket science. The individuals that were prepared to think that discomfort, a little bit of stress or a lot of stress in their case, has a good outcome, is a good response. When I feel this stress, when I feel my heart rate up, when I feel exhausted, it equals something positive in my life. Those are the individuals that quit much on a, on a lesser scale. Those are the individuals that got less um, citations from their supervisors. These are individuals that just did better in training. These individuals even had faster times in the obstacle course. Imagine that. So it carried over into physical activity. And that is just mindset. It's perspective. It's in the air. It's in your mind. It's how do I perceive how this stress and discomfort is going to sort of affect me down the line, right? So mindset is very important. So when you have somebody coming in, I think expectations are very important. This is going to hurt. It's going to be, might not be fun. Um, you know, there's going to be some soreness. You might not want to come tomorrow. You're going to get up and be like, oh, you know, I really don't want to do this. Preparation and mindset, knowing that we have to reinforce that thought with a positive outcome. Very, very, very important. So there's a ton of directions I wanna go, but I wanna go down the road of, of stress and how our body interprets stress. And I wanna get your take on it because if you really listen to what uh, a lot of the research is saying, when we talk about a lot of things that are in vogue right now. So we have cold, you know, cold plunges and ice baths. We have sauna. Uh, we have obviously high intensity exercise when it, uh, even things like fasting, 
it's mm -hmm. all a lot of it is interpreted in your cells very much the same way. And it's just this intermittent stress that on the surface, you look at it. And you know, you know, I've, I've heard people talk about exercise, even, and you look at all the things it does in terms of raising your blood pressure, raising your heart rate, increasing cortisol, all these things you would think are horrible things in, in, in medicine, but actually has this magical response where we come back stronger from it and you're more resilient from it. And so is the biggest differentiating factor in these things that are that we bring around this use stress, this, this positive stress and how it has an effect positively on our body versus what we've most of the times we, we has this connotation of stress being distress because I'm stressed mm -hmm. from work or from my family mm -hmm. or money or, or any of these other things that I have. Is it that we have control over that stress and we choose that stress? Is that the biggest factor why it has such a positive impact? Yeah, I think, I think the distinction here has to be the differentiation between chronic stress and acute stress responses. Now, you know, we can dive deep into the weeds of physiology. Now, when your body experiences the word stress, stress, what does stress even mean? It means that there's work that has to be done that's putting your body under some sort of load that needs to change, right? Whether it's emotional stress, physical stress, whether it's running or working or working late hours, your body is being put under a load, your mind, body and mind. How does your body respond to that? Now, remember, your body does not know it's 2023. Your body thinks, your primitive brain and your body is a caveman. It's a caveman, survival, efficiency, survival, efficiency, survival, efficiency. That's all it's doing every day, every second. So when you're stressed, your body's going, I need to make more sugar, increase cortisol, liver pumps out sugar, cortisol goes up. I need to reduce my immune response. I need to do all of these things, Physio I need to shift my blood flow. All of these things happen. When that is chronic, 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 without the ability to heal from that inflammatory cascade, that's when you have illness and pain and injury and emotional breakdown as well, right? Emotional pain has the same response. High anxiety has the similar response to running a marathon. So your body has this cascade of physiological events that take place. The difference is, the very, very important difference is that if you present your body with these stressors in a periodized fashion, in a controlled, structured, periodized fashion, and your body has time to go, okay, I got over that. This is how I got over that. I healed, I repaired, now I rest, I go back to baseline. And guess what? I'm prepared for the next time. And the next time I'm going to be even more efficient at it. Remember the efficiency cascade. So what we're trying to do with health and wellness and fitness, and, and as you said, this trend now with cold shower, cold baths and you know, ice immersion and um, heat shock proteins and all this stuff of stressing your body, it's very acute, it's very short. It's allowing your body to have a quick adaptive process, but you're always coming back to baseline, but that baseline is gonna be a reset thermostat. It's gonna be a reset threshold, right? So that's the important thing, but I'm telling you more than anything, chronic stress, chronic inflammation, chronic high cortisol, chronic high sugar levels, all of these things, very, very detrimental to us neurophysiologically and physiologically. Um, it's about building resilience. It's really about building resilience. It's showing your body these little challenges over time to reset that baseline to be more resilient. Okay, so let's keep going down this road. So in, in our course, I have a, a section that I talk about that we're at this unique time where we're at what I call the crossroads between fragile and broken, right? So I may have two different people come into me uh, and they're both talking about a, a shoulder issue that they're dealing with. One is dealing with that issue because they're just fragile because they don't do anything. They, they you know, especially post COVID, they work remotely. They sit at a dining room table. The most action they get is to get up and get the door dash or change the Netflix. And so their body's just deteriorating. And so their shoulder is, is in this state because of, because of basically they're fragile. Right. And so they have to be handled with very kick gloves. And then on the opposite side, you know, it's very different, you know, even going back to, to, to when we started at one human performance, like there wasn't people doing these boot camps and doing obstacle course races and ultra marathons, especially people in forties, fifties, and sixties. Mm -hmm. So like now you have this entire uh, population that's really drawn towards extreme activities. And you know, that same person breaks down that comes in with a shoulder issue, but they're broken 
because of almost that that too much stress and finding that balance between the two. And if I just give them all the same shoulder program, I'm going to fail miserably. So yeah. I want to talk more about like, what is it about that second population? I know that there's, there's a, you know, and there's a great book, What Does Not Kill Us. Um, and it talks about the, our kind of primal need for challenge. Mm -hmm. And, and it's part of our, it's part of our biology, but unfortunately only a part of that population is being drawn to that. And then there's still that population that's, that's hiding under the covers on the couch and watching Netflix. So like, what's the main difference that drives person to, towards one end of that spectrum or the other? Yeah, I think so. A lot of that's obviously personality structure, right? Um, I think personally that, you know, this big sort of, you know, without naming specific things like these very high intensity workout programs where you're swinging all over the place and um, obstacle courses where they're like, hey, run to the top of a mountain and get, get electrocuted. That sounds like fun. You know, all of these things, these are absolutely challenges. And, and what that does is it takes a society or an individual who it's an existential thing, Eric, and I'm bringing some philosophy and some psych into this, but it's an existential thing. It's, it's, I want to feel alive. I want to feel that I can accomplish something. I sit in a cubicle all day. I want to be a hero. And what that's doing is, is that's going back to our roots. Exactly what you said. It's our primitive desire for challenge and to overcome challenge, right? I want to be a hero. I want to be the superhero in the movies. I want to save the day. I want, I want to run to the top of a mountain, despite all the pain and discomfort. The, the problem, unfortunately, is that if you've been sitting on a couch, um, not very good for you, right? Now, that's the particular population. It's an existential issue that I think some very wise businessmen tapped into. Um, and they also are probably lining, <laughs> probably making orthopedic surgeons very rich as well. And maybe they're helping you out because they need to be fixed after they do something like that. Um, but, uh, but they're tapping into that existential crisis of the mundane lifestyle where, you know, men and women need challenge and, and want to overcome challenge to feel accomplished and feel like they did something important and something fun and something challenging. It makes you feel alive. And that's the basis of that. Now, on the other hand, we're going to run into, and, and I got to be careful not to overgeneralize because one thing I've learned over the course of all these years of being in behavioral health is that every single person is completely unique. Um, we do kind of have themes and we have a lot of themes about what makes us who we are, um, but everybody's incredibly unique. And I, and I think that the individuals that are reluctant to move, are reluctant to exercise, are reluctant to get outside, I do think it has probably a lot to do with comfort. And, and, and I'm going to go, we're going to keep beating this dead horse of, of efficiency and doing the least amount that you can and getting away with as much as you can because your body's in survival mode. It's hard to get up and walk around the block and get out of breath if you're comfortable on the couch, right? I mean, that's the basics of it. You don't need a PhD or, or an MD to, to figure that one out. I think it has to do with fear. I think it has to do with fear of failure. I think it has to do a lot to do with anxiety and anxiety is stemmed in the fear of the unknown. Eric, I don't, and the fear of losing control. I, I'm promising you right now, no matter what anxiety presentation you present me with, I will trace it back to a fear of losing control. A fear of losing control, which means you're just, you're scared of the unknown, right? So, so these are individuals who are just afraid, you know, they're, they're afraid. And, and I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. I mean, we're all afraid in, in certain aspects, but uh, maybe afraid of injury, maybe afraid of being judged, maybe afraid of failure, right? Fill in the blank. But that's that population that's probably hard to move into the movement category. And then finally, I mean, just, you know, I mean, what I've learned over and over and over and over, and as you have as well, is that the human body and mind really is a use it or lose it phenomenon. It just is. It just is. And again, that goes back to efficiency and survival. If we're not using something, your body says, okay, I can put this energy somewhere else. I don't need to build muscle tissue. I don't need stable joints. I don't need a resilient mind because I'm not being tackled with challenging things that I have to overcome. I'm not do, I don't have to do calculations every day. So your body will go into the efficient zone and be complacent if you don't push it a little bit. Now I want to circle back to the whole fear thing. Cause I have a question about that in a minute, but <clears throat> how much of this could possibly be uh, the, the connection between uh, expectation and also cultural factors. Like one of the things when you're talking about having this challenge and having this existential component to it, like certain cultures have something uh, called a misogi, 
right? Mm -hmm. Where they have one thing, like that's something that they have to do that's way out of their reach that they're going to do where they're going to set a goal for that each year. You know, Jack LaLanne mm -hmm. used to, what you know, mm -hmm. swim with dragging boats each year. And, and, and it's part of a cultural thing mm -hmm. in certain cultures. How much is driven by that in the expectations and what, what you see in terms of the comfort of what's around you in your society or the, or your, your circle of people that, that you're spending the most time with. I, th I, again, I think incredibly powerful, unbelievably powerful. I mean, you could just look at different cultures. I mean, who do you surround yourself with in your life? And those are going to be your expectations and goals, right? You know, I mean, in child psychiatry and child psychology, we look at peer groups, we look at peer groups and who you surround yourself with. I mean, look, it's, it's no, it's no, you know, uh, ridiculous phenomenon that if you attend a high school where 90% of the people go to top tier colleges, you know, you're probably going to strive to do that. If unfortunately you're in a, in, you know, a socioeconomic circumstance where you don't have those opportunities, it's going to be harder to do that. And that's sociology. We know that who and what you're surrounding yourself with will define your goals and challenges and what you want. We see this every day in sociological structure. We see it every day. So absolutely. Um, that's why, that's why group training is a good thing, right? Because you have peers that are doing things with you. That's why teams work so well. It's psychology. It's team psychology. Um, you know, that's why, you know, if, listen, and like I said, I could read this stuff verbatim in the books, but it's hard to push me to do certain things. But I'll tell you what, if I sign up for a race or something that I have to do in three months, it gives me the impetus to get there, to train. It gives me some sort of, you know, um, goal. So goal setting is very important as well. But back to your point without getting too tangential, you know, your culture, who you surround yourself with will define the goals and challenges that you assign for yourself, undoubtedly. Okay, so let's go with goals and let's talk about fears. And you talked about fear of failure, but how much of an impact could actually like fear of success be an issue? Meaning like one of the challenges in, um, you know, Lane Norton talks about this and he talked about the actor Ethan Suplee, who if you're not familiar with, he was in Remember the Titans, he was a super heavy set kid who was the, the lineman and he completely transformed himself. Um, and lost hundreds of pounds. And he said, one of the keys is he said, every morning I have to wake up and kill my former self. Mm. And to be abil the ability to kind of let go of the fact that, oh, I'm not an exercise person. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I'm just a fat guy. Oh, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not an athlete or whatever <clears throat> that, that self-limiting barrier you have because it's a safety net and you, you have almost a fear of success because now you have to redefine yourself and you're gonna have to do it every day. Yep. Yeah, I think, you know, something that you're touching on that I think is worth discussing from a psych psychiatric perspective is the concept of cognitive distortions. Now, we look at anxiety, depression, mood disorders, uh, lack of motivation, something we call anhedonia, where you stop enjoying things, um, self-criticism, low self-esteem. There was an individual named Aaron Beck, who many years ago came up with the concept of cognitive behavioral work, and so incredibly profound because it's been empirically verified a thousand times over. This works. And, and I'm going to give you the very, very um, small, uh, I'm going to give you the very basics of cognitive behavioral intervention. As human beings, we tell ourselves lies. We have a prosecutor and a defense attorney sitting on our shoulder all the time. And guess who talks more? The prosecutor talks more. The judge is right in the middle, which is your, your ego and your consciousness. You have a prosecutor, you know, the old angel and devil thing. But this is very relevant because just like your story, right? I'm not a workout guy. I'll never be healthy. I'm unfit. They're going to judge me. I'm fat. I'm no good. I can't do this. There's that prosecutor. If you don't have the defense attorney saying, whoa, hold on. Wait a second. Where's the validity with everything that you're saying right here? Let's talk some validity here. W why are you a bad person? Well, that's just not true. It's just not true. It's a cognitive distortion and breaking it down. Why are you not a gym person? What does that even mean? Right? What does that even mean? Let's break that down and let's get to the foundation of these things. And then that eventually changes behavior. That's why it's called cognitive behavioral therapy. What you think leads to how you behave leads to how you feel. Right. So I think that's very, very relevant as to what you're saying. So you have to question that prosecutor 
all the time and try to debunk some of those cognitive distortions that humans think. And I'll give you just some very simple examples. Overgeneralization. We overgeneralize. That's what we do. Again, efficiency and survival, we overgeneralize. We black and white think one way or the other. We don't like that in between. Our brains don't like that. It's, la it's loss of control. What else do we do? Um, we discount positives. If I tell you 10 positive things and one negative thing, guess which one you're going to remember? The negative thing. You're going to focus on that. Again, for survival, I need to pay attention to the dangerous stuff. The good stuff, okay, cool. I can survive with that. Oh, no, no, no. This person said um, lazy. Oh, right. That's where the, the motivation comes out. So we do these things as humans, these cognitive distortions that we're constantly telling ourselves. And unless you pay attention to that, you're not going to change your behavior. So very, very, very important stuff. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And I can tell you from from some of my wayward youth days that if you give a couple drinks to that defense attorney, <laughs> he'll take the day off and you let you do it some really bad decisions. Um, but I digress. Hey, everybody, a quick break in the action here. Hope you're enjoying the show and we appreciate you listening. We're working hard to bring you the highest quality content and best guests every single week. So if you could do us a big favor and go and like and subscribe to the show on whatever platform you get your podcasts on, it would be greatly appreciated. Be sure to listen at the end of the show also to find out where you can find out more information about our courses, as well as a special discount code for all our listeners. Thanks again, and let's get back to the show. You know, we talk about also in our course when we, when we initially start with a new client is that before we go in, and as much as I teach courses on evaluation, on how to evaluate someone's performance and their movement and all these different things, we say sometimes the most important evaluation is what we call the key questions. It's just asking the right questions and, and getting to that next level and, and getting to the why instead of saying, okay, why are you here? Well, I want to lose 10 pounds. So saying, okay, and then measure their weight and just proceed with giving a program to say, okay, how'd you come up with 10? What happens at 10? What could you now do at 10 that you couldn't do before? And then why 10 and not nine or 11? Mm -hmm. Like, why not that? And, and then to say, okay, well, what if you didn't lose a single pound, but you looked exactly how you want to look, would that matter? Mm -hmm. And then you kind of boil it down and say, well, no, it, it, I guess it really doesn't matter. And so then changing those expectations and changing kind of the, changing the scoreboard, so to speak, mm -hmm. really changes in terms of what you said before in terms of mindset. So mm -hmm. kind of talk a little bit about getting to the why with people. Yeah, you know, I'm going to butcher this. And, and I apologize, uh, Mr. Nietzsche, but I believe it was Friedrich Nietzsche that said, if you show me any why, I'll give you the how. Something like that. And, and I apologize for destroying that. But the fact is, if you have a why, if you have meaning, then you will figure out how. Right. And I think that pertains to exactly what you're saying here is to give these young athletes or these individuals that want to perform in some way or feel better, or be out of pain or, you know, whatever it might be that you're working with them on or recovery, whatever it might be, they have to find meaning in that. They have to have some sort of meaning in the sense of the why. And I think it's a very, very important question to ask somebody. So it's, it's amazing that you're doing that because that again will drive behavior. It will drive the how. It also makes the how easier. Why am I doing this? What is it that I want and why? Why is this meaningful to me? Really thinking that through because that's what's going to get you up at five o'clock in the morning when it's, when it's dark outside to go you know run five miles in the cold. That's what's going to drive your motivation is understanding the meaning and the why behind what you're doing. So it's ridiculously important. And it's, I'm so happy that you're doing that with your clients. So the other thing we talk about is the importance of, of just that, of having that why, because that drives your habits. Yep. And we talk about having non-negotiable habits. And, and I tell the story that like, look, we're teaching a course on program design. I could run circles around 99% of the world in terms of how to write a program in terms of picking the right exercise and the reps and the sets and the tempo and all that stuff. But none of that matters. We don't even get into that stuff until like three quarters of the way through our course. Cause we got to explain like the non-negotiable habits is really ultimately what gets people to where they want to be. And I, mm -hmm. and I tell the story, we, you know, in the, one of the facilities I was renting space out of, we used to have a guy who used to walk around and it was an industrial park. And I don't know what this guy's deal was. And he would, but he had this thing where he'd walk every day and he'd stop 
right in front of our door. And it was the oddest thing. And it was kind of off putting at first. And you just <laughs> march in place with this big exaggerated arm drive. And at first it's like, do I need to like call the, the you know, the authorities like this? And, and then we noticed it would happen because I train, you know, these people on a regular schedule that I noticed it always happened during this one woman session. Uh -huh. And then I realized like it, it completely flipped in my mind to say, you know what, I'll take that guy's program over 99% of the programs that are out there. Cause that guy does it. It didn't matter if it was 90 degrees or if it was two degrees, if it was raining or if it was sunny, if it was snow, he did it no matter what. Cause he made up in his mind that no matter what I'm going to get this done today. And yep. so what are some of the keys for an individual to create realistic and sustainable non-negotiable habits? Yeah, for sure. And this has been studied. This has been studied ad nauseum for many, many reasons. You know, industrial psychologists study this because they talk about job performance. It's not just about, you know, getting healthy and fit and having big biceps, you know, for the summer. It's, it's motivational psychology. It's why do we do what we do? We want to understand this. What makes people successful in work, in their careers? What makes people successful on the, on the sports field? So been studied ad nauseum. And there are many, many, many theories as to what motivates people and what drives people to do something and develop habits. But the foundation of it all, Eric, the foundation of it all is to set attainable goals where there is a positive reinforcement of some kind at an attainable goal at interim, right? Now, um, there's many, many, many sort of uh, permutations of that. But what ends up happening eventually is that once you reach a goal and you get a reward and you reach a goal and you get a reward and you reach a goal and get a reward, that becomes your efficiency. That becomes your meaning. That becomes your striving to continue. Um, as, as incredibly complex as we are, and we are ridiculously complex, I think of the mind as the final frontier. It's like space. You know, everything I've studied, we still have no idea to be humble. Um, but we're so complex, yet we are so primitive at the same time. It's like a paradox. And we really are a mouse in a cage with a little piece of cheese. I mean, you know, pardon the, pardon the metaphor. I know that's extreme, but, but it's true. You need small attainable goals. You cannot overwhelm somebody and have a negative response. They will never come back or they will stop. Right. So very, very, very important. Um, and that's called reinforcement theory. Reinforcement theory goes back to the days of BF Skinner, where, you know, you have some, you have an animal do a task. They get a reward. Guess what? They do it again. You have an animal that does a task. They get a negative reinforcement, like a little shock or something unpleasant. Guess what? They don't do it again, right? So it's very, very simple, very primitive. Um, that's reinforcement theory. Then there's goal theory, which is goal setting. Um, there's there's a lot of complexity to this. Um, you know, I, I do think too. You know, we talked about mindset and expectations are incredibly important in that as well, as far as meaning. Um, but small attainable goals. You could read textbook after textbook after textbook. Attainable goals with a positive reinforcement is going to get you to that final, final finish line down the line and keep you going. Now, what's interesting though, is to go to your point of individuality is that, you know, the, the common thing you'll hear at a, you know, a dinner party or at the, you know, uh, you know, any social setting and they'll talk about losing weight and they say, oh, it's better if you only lose a pound or two a week and it's more long-term and sustainable. And for the vast majority of people, that's true. Um, but they've done studies with people who are obese when you have significant amount of weight to lose that if those people only lose a couple pounds a week that they actually will quit because it's not enough to move the needle mm -hmm. to have them have an impression because relative to their size, obviously it's not enough to have them have that motivation to keep going. And they actually do better when they lose a lot of weight up front. Sure. And right, because that's a very, very big reward. You know, this, this is so analogous to what I do in behavioral health. If somebody comes to me and they're incredibly anxious or they're having panic attacks five times a week, or they're unbelievably depressed and say they have no reason to live. And we have multiple, multiple sessions over the course of months and months and months. I remind them and I take notes and I do, I do, I take data. I take objective data, you know, like various rating scales of mood and whatnot. And the reason I do that is the same reason you take a before and after picture in a gym. It's because, you know, you're going to come to me, you're going to talk about these things. And you know what? You might not even feel good when you leave, but we're going to have a before and an after to show you that these tiny little changes over time really had an effect. And 
the point that I'm getting to is there's something called the Hawthorne effect. And I don't know if you're aware of this term. It's a psychological term. It's a motivational psychological term. The Hawthorne effect is that people do better when there's measurable results, measurable quantities of feedback. People also do better when they think they're being observed. Now, this is the workplace. This is working out. This is anything you could think of, really. The Hawthorne effect is very profound. So individuals need that feedback and 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 sort of what you do being, being a, a trainer is observing them, making sure you're giving feedback, making sure that you have data to show them, right? So the Hawthorne effect is very profound as well. Yeah. And I would imagine also because we're really bad judges of ourselves. Um, you know, when I take someone and, and do some retesting and they'll say, uh, you know, I'm not doing that good with my weight. And then I'll show like, well, your weight didn't move on the scale, but you actually lost four pounds of body fat and put on two pounds of lean body mass. Or, you know, hey, that, that movement that you couldn't do before, you couldn't even go near a deep squat. And now all of a sudden you're rock bottom and, and it's pain free and it feels fine. Um, those things, because they live in that body 24 hours a day, they don't notice those small changes uh, exactly. throughout time. And so exactly. um, I think that's, that's incredibly impactful to, to have. Now, I'm going to shift gears here. And so uh, I, I don't know what I have to do in my editing to put up the trigger warning here, Doc, right. but I'm going to come, come at you and, and your friends in the medical community a little bit. Um, and, and not so much uh, in a um, you know, confrontational way, but I want to understand better why that the medical community doesn't seem to understand or appreciate the power of fitness and exercise and its impact on health and wellness and longevity and psychology. And it's so well researched and so well documented, yet they don't seem to give it the credit it deserves. So what's the deal? Yeah, a good one. Really, really good one. Well, I want to say this one thing right before we discuss this, I do think it's getting better. I sincerely think it's getting better because I think now more than ever, physicians, medical practitioners are, are really seeing how important preventative medicine is. I think for the majority of the 80s and 90s up to the early 2000s, I think we were all about fixing things. We were the fixers. We were, give it to me when it's broken, I'll put it back together and send you off on your way. That's what physicians did. And I think that now more than ever, and I mean this sincerely, I see it in the hospitals, I see it when I talk to my colleagues, I see it in behavioral health, that we are really, really getting to the point of preventative medicine and saying, wait a second, hold on, let's get to the bottom of this. And I deal with this with depression and anxiety, where I see patients and I say, listen, I can give you a pill. I can give you a pill that might work, maybe we can get it up to maybe a 70% response rate, but you want to know something else? If you do 20 minutes of cardiovascular exercise every day, this is what the data shows. Your mood is going to improve, right? So we're really starting to understand the, the importance of that. I, I think, you know, and I can't speak for all of my colleagues. I could sort of just speak for what, how I perceive things. You know, when you study medicine, Eric, when you, when you go to medical school, you are, you are inundated with so much. The old analogy is it's like trying to drink water out of a fire hose. You know, you are inundated with so much information that you have to put it in silos. And what ends up happening because of that is that we're leaning away from general practice. Hardly anybody is going into family medicine, internal medicine anymore, which is general practitioners. Hardly any medical student, I mean, some, but the, the trend is down and everyone is specializing in these super specialized areas of medicine. Now, what does that do? If you think about it, what does it do? It isolates you as a practitioner. So if your super, super, super specialty is pediatric neurologic seizure disorder, right? Then that's your thing. And that's all, well, it's not all, you know, you were trained in medicine, but that's your specialty. And that's what you're going to focus on. And then that's going to bring you back to the whole, when that's broken, that's what I know how to fix. And I, I think that's, that's very important to acknowledge. And that despite how super specialized medicine is becoming, we need to remember our roots and go back to preventative medicine for the health of the patient. Now, as you mentioned in the intro, I went to an osteopathic medical school. And, you know, it's for people that don't know, there's DO and MD. Those are the two United States fully licensed medical doctors in the United States. And I was really drawn to the DO philosophy because they base themselves in that. It's like, okay, hold on. Your, your primary care providers first. It's a little bit more holistic. So I do understand that. I get it. But I also see the trends of exactly what you're saying. So hopefully you can understand what I'm saying. I'm not making excuses. I just see that's the trend of medicine is to hyper-specialize. And when you hyper-specialize, 
you're myopic. You are, you, your view is, is this big when it comes to health and fitness. Listen, I, and again, not putting down any colleagues or anything, but listen, four years of medical school, six years of residency training, master's degree, undergraduate degree. Ask the average doctor about nutrition, basic nutrition. They're, they're going to be like, I, I don't know, take a multivitamin, right? I mean, it's crazy, you know, because they're, and it's not because they're ignorant. It's because they're so focused on what they do that they don't have the time, energy, effort to kind of focus on the big picture. That's my, I don't know, that's my editorialization of the whole thing. I, I don't know if it's accurate, but that's what I see. All right. So I also don't want it to, to feel like I'm firing all the arrows in your direction because I'm no. going to turn the bullseye back on us. And, <laughs> and as I, and I, uh, before I do that, I'll also preface it by saying like, I actually just had this discussion with, with someone else on, a, on uh, another podcast is say that the kind of beauty of what I do is that I get to change lives, but I don't, I don't have to save lives. Like if someone clutches their heart in a restaurant and goes down, no one yells quick, get a strength coach, right? Thank God. <laughs> I don't have to have that where, where, you know, thank God for people like yourself. And, and I also don't blame you because as a fitness industry, we've done a really crappy job of making this impression that fitness is this go hard or go home that you're supposed to beat up. Like the, mm. like if I ask 10 people, and when I tell you, I ask everybody over the last 25 years of doing this, you know, what makes a good workout? You know what they tell me 99.9% .9 of the time is that it was really hard and I sweat a lot. And I was sore afterwards. And right. if that's all you think exercise is, then I, I joke. I said, all right, perfect. Come to my house this weekend. I'm going to give you a list of stuff to do. And you'll be really sore and you'll sweat a lot and it'll be really hard. I, you won't be any more fit or be any better at your sport, but guess what? I'll have a nice garage and backyard. So with that, you know, I think that going back to data, like it, in a utopian world, if you look at what some of the data shows, like if you look at research that's been done on tens of thousands of people, grip strength mm. has a higher correlation with mortality than blood pressure does. Mm -hmm. Yet you can't go into a doctor's office without getting your blood pressure checked, but I've yet to meet a doctor that ever had pulled out a dynamometer and checked yeah. my grip strength, yeah, right? Yeah. VO2 max, you can have, there are cutoff points where they can tell you basically when you're never going to be able to live without assistance mm -hmm. and give you that warning sign. Mm -hmm. But you know, when's the last time you saw a metabolic car in your doctor's office? So right. if we have these powerful things that, can, that are such huge predictors, how can we get to leverage that and get these two communities to kind of, to talk and, and yeah. interface? Yeah. 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 Yo, it's incredible points. You know, you know what I keep thinking about, I think about how long it takes from research, from breakthrough research to actual implementation in the world of general medicine. Right. I mean, yeah, I'll pull any textbook up here, right? I'm, I'm studying, you know, a huge textbook here about psychopharmacology. This thing probably is from 2015 and it was probably written in 2012, right? So that's ancient, right? But it's what I use in 2023. I guess my point is it takes time. It just seems to take time. There's a lag between solid research and implementation. And, you know, we see anything from like five to 10 years, as crazy as that sounds, right? As crazy as that sounds. And I think, and again, you know, I can editorialize here. I don't want to be super opinionated. I want to stick to facts, but it's, you know, there's a lot of bureaucracy in medicine. There's a lot of hoops to jump through to get new medicines passed, new, you know, the American Cardiology Association has to adopt, you know, an ideal thing after five years of research and the committee meets 25 times, right? Then they finally say, okay, here's our new standard. It just takes time. And if you have future thinkers like yourself who are on top of the latest research, everyone else is going to lag behind. You know, the good news is, hey, wait, this is actually really good news. I think this is actually awesome, is you are less bound than a, a medical physician is because my practice has to reflect what's accepted in the medical community, or I can get into trouble which is frustrating. I mean, imagine how frustrating that is. You know, I have to tell people what the guidelines of the FDA and the DEA and the American Psychiatric Association and the American Family Medicine Association deem appropriate after the research has been reviewed, which again, super old, and I'm bound to that. And if I say, hey, I just read this awesome article about this newfangled thing, and I tell a patient that, you know, I don't know, is that ethical practice? Now, the good news is, is that you're on top of this stuff and you can make change now.
right? And again, I'm not complaining. I love medicine. It's an amazing field, but there, there are a lot of limitations. You know, there are a lot of limitations and we do have to wait for the data and the valid, accepted, peer-reviewed research before it becomes a dogma, before it becomes uh, something that we can use in practice. And, you know, look, it's there. that's there for a reason, for patient safety, right? It's it's not like we, we want to wait and not give people the good news. I, you know, just it just takes time, you know, a lot of hoops to jump through to get something changed in medicine. Yeah. And as you're saying this, it's funny because it's such polar opposites. And maybe that's why there's not the congruency is, yeah. is because there's pluses and minuses to both sides of it, right? I, I want my doctor to have some standardization because I don't want them just giving me something because they saw a cool Instagram post, right? <laughs> Where is in the in the fitness world, like we get information, we're getting our information from like shirtless mountain men eating organ meats in the middle of the woods who are loaded with steroids. Like that's our standard level of information. Right. And right. then, you know, and then so there, there's that 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 kind of dichotomy and, and there's pluses and minuses to that. Yeah. And then even in terms of the turnaround, like I've been doing this, this is year 25 for me doing fitness. I've been around long enough to see carbs be bad, good, bad, good, and good again. Like I've, I've seen, you know, every fitness trend go from, you know, cardiovascular exercise of what you should do, what you should do, what you shouldn't do, what you shouldn't do. And it's come back around at least four different times in my career. So it, the, the changing, the changeover of information of what's acceptable, and what's considered good is so quickly changing in fitness as well um, in terms of the trends that you see, right? So it, it's kind of interesting. And, and is that maybe why we just don't see eye to eye? Well, you know, I agree. And it, it does come down to safety. And, and you're right about that. And how frustrating is that? There really needs to be a happy medium. There needs to be a happy medium. Now, you know, I teach a course called, you know, uh, Appraisal of the Scientific Literature, where I'm trying to teach my residents to take the latest literature, read it, and is it valid? Was there bias there? Would you use this research to give your patient advice? So I think what's very, very important as healthcare practitioners, as fitness trainers in the fitness industry is to truly be able to understand the literature, right? Not all literature is created equal by far, right? I mean, like you said, an Instagram post of somebody who's jacked and eating organ meats, you're like, wow, I'm going to go buy myself a liver at the local butcher and, and you know, and take a nice bite. But you know, we need you guys as well as, as physicians and anybody that's going to give any advice to anybody need to understand bias and need to understand how to look at statistics and how to really say, wow, this is a really well done article. And it, it's a powerful article in the sense that it had a lot of, you know, it had a lot of N number, a lot of, you know, individuals that were tested. It, it was double blinded. Um, there's, there's no bias with regard to money or, you know, uh, you know, any sort of like pharmaceutical impact or anything like that. But my point is you guys, as well as physicians really need to know how to sift through the BS, right. Before we can really truly give advice in a safe and ethical manner. Um, and hopefully there's a happy medium. I think the happy medium is just as physicians really dedicating the time to stay on top of the latest research right? I, I think that that's um, probably very, well, it is very, very important, obviously. Um, but, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard. And look, you know, again, no complaining. I love what I do. But, you know, you, you get busy and you end up in these little silos of thought and you have to break out of that from time to time. I think, you know, you have to remind yourself of that just as much. I think the one thing that is common when you see in your experience uh, more importantly, someone who is great at what they do on either side of this, whether it's the, the medical or the fitness side, is that they there seems to be a common thread. And this is, you know, what I try to strive for is, is number one is, and getting buy-in, whether it's on your side, the bedside manner, or whether it's my side, getting people to, mm -hmm. to, to build rapport and trust is first meeting people where they're at. Like if you come in day one, I'm not going to go and put you on, you know, an explosive Olympic lifting program and sprint program, if you can't even touch your toes or, or, you know, do some very simple movements. So meeting them where they're at and then understanding progression and regression. And so like two in interactions with the medical community that I've had recently kind of opened my eyes to it on, on, on a negative side and on a positive side, on the negative side, I had a, a kid who had a stress fracture in his foot. And the, the, you know, the, he has one of these you know, dads who was like this high driving, like once, you know, hasn't played a hundred basketball games a year. And, and so he gets a stress fracture and he says, you know, he has a tournament this weekend 
And I, he said, do you think he'll be able to this, not meaning this weekend coming up, but, you know, about six weeks away. And I said, he said, do you think he could play in it? And I, he, uh, he said, but he's in a boot right now. I said, well, when does the boot come off? Well, the day before the tournament. He said, do you think he could play? And I said, well, that depends on a lot of things. I, I said, first of all, the medical doctor knows what's going on that I don't, that I can't see with x-ray eyes, that they know what the healing rate and all the things that have to happen structurally uh, from the inside out that I won't be able to see. Mm -hmm. I said, but also there needs to be a progression. I said, if there's some times we could take that boot off and we can do some body weight loading and then eventually take that into being able to do some deceleration, then eventually maybe some light plyometrics. So by the time we eventually ease that boot off and we get the green light, yes, there's a chance he may be able to play, right? And, you know, I said, ask your doctor about that. And they said, nope, no way. Boot needs to stay on for healing. That thing can never come off until that day, okay. right? Goes off, goes to the doctor that day, takes the boot off and says, you're good to go. You can go play basketball. So it's like, do we not understand? First of all, that's how he got a stress fracture is playing right. hundred games of basketball a year. Right. Second of all, like that's to me on my side of things, that's malpractice in terms of saying you just went from you're not allowed to do anything Then all of a sudden you're good. Like there's, there's a, a complete skipping of progression within there. Right now I'll tell you on the flip side where, where I had a very positive experience. We just had recently on our, on our show, an amazing guy, Steve Carnes, Steve Carnes to kind of truncate his amazing, amazing story, had a, a brain injury where he had 10 and a half hours surgery on his brain stem was completely shut down. Um, and then uh, was in the hospital for um, uh, his rehabilitation, you know, mm -hmm. couldn't walk, he could barely, he was in a hands and knees position, couldn't even move. And they said, you know, we want to get you up and walking in, in these parallel bars. And he's like, that's not how we learn how to move. He said, I know that innately from what I've been trained. He said, if that's what you're going to do, I'm out and checked mm -hmm. himself out of the hospital in a wheelchair and went wow. home and, and basically did his rehab on his wow. own. And now is he's to the point where he's climbing mountains, he's trail running, absolutely mm -hmm. amazing. So he has a group that he started called the movement project where he helps other brain injury patients from around the world. And he asked me to come on a couple of them. And I'm like, look, I don't know what I'm doing with mm -hmm. brain injury people, <laughs> right. but right. all I did was look at to say, okay, what is it that they can do safely? What is it that they shouldn't do? That's not safe. And then say, okay, meet them where they're at and say, all right, well, if you could do this, try to progress to this. And it was just really good progression. And to see what they were able to do when they've been told by the medical community mm -hmm. that they're done, that their progress is over, if, if you know, not recently, if, if by years. Mm -hmm. And to see what they were able to progress to was magical. Like, so how do we get in terms of that understanding of meet people where they're at and learn how to progress them to your point of giving them these small wins? Yeah, I think that's exactly it. I think that's exactly it. I think, I think that still, um, I mean, your brother's in the, in the physical therapy world, right? And he would probably have some really good insight into this. And, and I think, and I would guess that he would probably say something very similar that I said with regard to medicine is that we're a few years behind when it comes to, you know, the latest and greatest. So, you know, these individuals that have a brain injury and they're saying, okay, get up on the parallel bars. Like, whoa, hold on a second. Like, is that still valid? I mean, we've learned so much about progression and movement and neuroadaptation and all these things. We need to take those smaller things, smaller, smaller bites of this, you know, apple here. And, um, and what you brought to that was exactly that. Let's just look at basic movement and basic sort of from the ground up kind of building, right? Um, so, and I think that goes back to motivational psychology with exactly what we said earlier, is these very small steps with positive reinforcement and just moving on very, very quickly. Very, I mean, very, you know, as the people progress, I think it's just, it's common sense. Now, that being said, I think it's a testament to how much we don't know and I certainly, know, and I'm throwing out quotes everywhere. And I think this was Socrates or Plato, but you know, the more we learn, the less we know. And, and that was certainly very, very, very apparent to me as going through medical school and all this. And I think it's unbelievably important to have an open mind as a, as a medical practitioner as well, is to say, look, we don't know everything. And Eric, I'm here to tell you absolutely positively that, yeah, maybe I went to medical school and I went to an osteopath, osteopathic medical school and you know, spent all of these years and hours and hours of learning all this musculoskeletal medicine, you will teach me so much more than I know. And I think 
that's that humble position is very important for practitioners, medical practitioners to realize, right? So humility, knowing that we don't know everything, having an open mind to work with, you know, progressive physical therapists and, and, and trainers like yourself um, is, is ridiculously important. Um, and I, was, I lost my other point. I was I forgot my other point, but open mind, really open mind and understanding that we, we can learn from everybody um, and paying attention to that, really paying attention to that. Yeah, it's funny. I know we're, we're starting to go up against it with time, but I just thought of a story. I had a guy who was referred to me. He was a medical doctor and this guy was a, a very cool, amazing guy. I think he was, you know, still practicing like in his late seventies, maybe early eighties. And he came to me, he was having some breathing issues mm. and it was referred to me by a friend. And I said, look, he's a medical doctor. I don't, I don't do a pulmonary stuff. I don't know what to do. He's like, he says, yes, but you, t- you taught my son a lot about breathing and maybe you could help him. Mm-hmm. So the, I, I called him up. I said, look, I'm going to be quite honest with you. I have no idea what I'm doing or, or in terms of how I'm going to help you. But if you want to still come in, I'm more than happy to help you on uh, with anything. And so he came in and I just, you know, he said, look, it's not a medical issue. It's not anything. I've been cleared by pulmonologist. It's just, I have this struggle with managing my breathing. Mm-hmm. And I just taught him some really basic concepts of breathing in terms of, you know, where to breathe through, how to breathe, the, the, of implementing your diaphragm and yeah. just some very fundamental things that I teach anybody regardless mm-hmm. of fitness. And it was the, the funniest thing he turned to me, he's like, how is this? And he, he said, don't take this the wrong way. He goes, how is it I'm learning? I'm in a doctor. He goes, I'm, I'm been practicing medicine for 50 years. How am I learning this from you? A guy who's a trainer in the back of a baseball school in some warehouse. You know why? <laughs> I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Because you took the time to take him through the movements and have him practice them and feel them. Eric, it, listen, I can write analogy, right? Metaphor. I can write a textbook on how to ride a bicycle and be the ultimate expert on how to ride a bicycle step by step. If I've never ridden a bicycle, I mean, my book might be valid. It might be legit. It might be comparatively empirically verified. But if I never rode a bicycle, man, I don't know what I'm doing. So this doc or whatever, you could be a pulmonologist and study all this stuff and give the greatest advice in the world. But unless you've done it and experienced it, how practical is it for you? Right. So, so I think that's what you offered him. I think you offered the practicality of it, you know, the, the practice, which was incredibly important. I think you just described, you know, a large budding part of our, my industry is, is trainers who have never trained anybody. And now they have their online, you know, specialists. Um, But we could go on. We literally could go on all day. Um, but uh, in, in, in sake of time, let's, let's kind of wrap things up by talking about what you're working on now, what's kind of new and exciting for 2023 and um, you know, what's, what's kind of on the, on the horizon for you. Yeah. Thanks so much. I, I think um, so. So honestly, the greatest thing in the world being with you today, thanks for taking the time. And, um, and again, like I said, I learn a tremendous amount from you every day and humility is incredibly important. Um, which is why I have to come back and see you. Um, and we got to talk about my motivation. So, uh, so that's one st- one thing. So, as far as what I'm up to these days, so um, I do I do media, I do TV work. Um, I'm associate program director at the hospitals, but I'm shifting gears to get really involved in academic medicine, which is unbelievably rewarding because I'm teaching these young doctors how to be better doctors and and learn the practice of medicine, psychiatry, neurology, and it's it's so rewarding that I've kind of been shifting gears that way. But you know, I just I want people to, you know, follow me on Instagram um, and uh, YouTube and all that fun stuff. And um, I'm a firm believer in man makes plans and God laughs. So I'm just kind of going with the flow right now. And it feels pretty good. Um, Yeah, that's it, man. That's absolutely awesome. And we'll share all those links and let's get some of those young medical students to come play in the sandbox with us on the, uh, on the forefront of fitness. And let's try to change a few things out there that we talked about today. I'm in. Awesome. Well, I can't thank you enough. Great, great, great practitioner, a real thought leader, and uh, definitely follow his stuff. And and and, it, and more importantly, great to call him, uh, call him an old friend. So, uh, Dr. Dominic Sportelli, thank you again for your time, and want to thank you, the listener, for tuning in once again to the Principles of Performance podcast. Thank you for listening to the Principles of Performance podcast. If you've enjoyed our content, please like and share on your social media outlets as well as subscribe and give us a review on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or whatever your preferred platform is to listen to. 
For more information on the Principles of Program Design courses and workshops, visit us at www.principlesofprogramdesign.com and follow us on all of the social media channels where we post new content every day. To save 10% on any PPD courses, enter the discount code PRINCIPLESPODCAST10 at checkout. If you have any questions we can answer or suggestions for the show, you can email us at info at principlesofprogramdesign.com or message us on social media. Thank you again for your support.